Thanks very much, Anya. So thanks very much, everyone, to coming to this very special session. Um, you're, uh, I'm, I'm quite excited to be here. This is uh, uh, quite a high-level panel from NASA. Does anyone know who NASA is? Have you have you, one or two people I see might have heard who NASA is? It's NASA. You know, everybody, everybody that I've spoken to. From, from anywhere in the world knows who NASA is. You talk about space, you talk about NASA. So I would like to give a very warm welcome to a very special group of people. Uh, we have uh, joining us from Washington, D.C., uh, Dr. John, uh, John Gransfeld. He's the NASA Associate Administrator for Science. And he's also a NASA astronaut. He's been on five shuttle missions, three of them to service the Hubble Space Telescope. You guys heard of the Hubble Space Telescope? Let's give a warm welcome to John Grunstall. <laughs> then we have Dr. Ellen Stefan, who's the NASA Chief Scientist. <laughs> Dr. John Mather, who is a Nobel Prize winner for his work on the cosmic mi uh, microvector. And he's also the NASA project scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the next big thing after Hubble. Then we have Dr. Claudia Alexander, who is the NASA JPL project uh, principal investigator for the Rosetta mission. That was to send something to the public. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to run through each of them briefly so that they can give you an idea of what they do and uh, uh, who they are and uh, and then we'll open it up this is your opportunity to ask questions this is your opportunity to engage with some of the people that make the most exciting space stuff happen and uh, so as you we go along uh, write down your questions or keep it in mind we're going to open up for questions as soon as each of them have had a chance to say something so I'd like to open up to welcome Dr. John Gransfeld to say a few words. Thank you very much. Really a pleasure to be in front of you all uh, from our spot here uh, halfway across the planet. Uh, my name is John Gransfeld. As you've heard, I'm an astrophysicist. I study stars and galaxies and exoplanets, planets around other stars. Um, but I'm also the head of science for NASA. Uh, as you heard, I'm an astronaut. I've flown five space shuttle missions. And you might ask, you know, how did I get involved in flying to space? How did I get involved in science? And it really starts from when I was just a young boy, uh, laying down on the ground and looking at the stars at night. For me, that was the most fascinating thing uh, to do. And, you know, not, more than a few times I would fall asleep and wake up later in the night. Um, but I would look up at the stars and wonder, you know, is anybody out there? You know, are there other planets around those stars? And is anybody laying down on their own uh, ground looking back at, at Earth? I found that very compelling. 
And as, as a young boy, I loved science. I was very curious. I loved nature and I loved science. And so for all of my life, I've studied science. Uh, I was also inspired in the 1960s by the Apollo program, the program that launched the first people to the moon. And I thought that was a really neat thing to do, very adventurous. And so combining my interest in stars and space travel, I decided I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, it was a little bit of a long path. I had to go to, you know, finish high school and go to university. And all the way, I studied science. I studied physics, uh, the study of how things work in the universe. Uh, eventually, I was a professional astronomer building experiments to go to space. And you're going to hear of a uh, similar experience from, from Dr. John Mather sitting next to me. Um, but my goal was to, to build my own satellite and send it up into space. Uh, at some point, I actually sent in an application to become an astronaut. Uh, and then it was not only about sending my own experiment into space, but actually going into space myself. And that was the most fantastic adventure uh, I've ever been on, uh, each of the missions. And most importantly, the missions to the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was designed for astronauts like myself to go up and put new cameras in it uh, so that Hubble could unravel the mysteries of the universe. And the Hubble Space Telescope has had five visits by astronauts. Um, and the most recent one, we put in a really amazing digital camera uh, that's been able to take images of uh, the very most distant galaxies, more detailed images of the planets in our own solar system and everything in between. And it's because we were able to put in those cameras uh, that it's still operating really well today. And the Hubble Space Telescope is available to everybody on planet Earth to use. And in fact, if you like, you can go onto the Hubble website, download the images that Hubble has taken and do your own science. And I encourage you all to do that. Uh, the other thing that being an astronaut has allowed me to do is to look back at planet Earth. Uh, and I've actually seen your home from space many, many times. And you live in a very beautiful place. So I hope all of you, when you can, you know, get outside and look around and realize how special uh, your place in South Africa is uh, because it really is one of the paradises on planet Earth. Uh, so with that, uh, I think I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Mather. And I'm interested in your questions. So questions now or later? Uh, later. Later. Yeah, okay. let, let's let's handle the questions later. Uh, so keep 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 a note of everything you want to ask him. Okay. So um, I'm John Mather, and I think my history is similar in many ways to John Gwensfeld's, except I never decided to go be an astronaut. But I grew up as a uh, young child. I was very interested to know how did we get here, uh, where did we come from, uh, how. And my dad was a geneticist, so he worked on dairy cows. So I wanted to know about the uh, internal workings of uh, of inheritance. So it was pretty clearly that was important and interesting. Uh, in uh, 1946, when I was born, uh, very little was known about any of these things. Uh, the space age had not begun. Uh, astronomy was still very mysterious. So I thought that was one of the greatest mysteries that I could work on. As I uh, went through school, I wanted to be an astronomer. And uh, I kept on doing that and finally got to, uh, to become a, a, a physicist astronomer after graduate school. Uh, I went to Berkeley, uh, California for my graduate school, and uh, I had a thesis project there which was going to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the heat left over th from the Big Bang itself. Um, my thesis project actually failed to function properly, so I had to write a, a thesis about a failed experiment. And nevertheless, um, six months later, and I was a, uh, 28 years old, and NASA said they wanted proposals for new satellite missions. So I was now working at a small NASA laboratory in New York City. And I said, boss, my uh, thesis project failed, but we should try it to, anyway in outer space. So we made up a team. We proposed a satellite, which we called the Cosmic Background Explorer Satellite. And uh, 15 years later, it was launched by NASA into space. And it did what we would hope to do. Uh, my thesis project finally worked. And uh, we measured the heat of the cosmic background radiation, uh, the leftover of the, the incredible uh, early conditions of the universe. So we, found, we measured its color. We found that it matched the predictions of what we call the Big Bang Theory uh, exactly uh, and uh, with extraordinary accuracy. Uh, we also measured and made a map and found that the uh, 
radiation that we receive is not equally bright in every direction, but uh, if you had eyes that could see at the right wavelengths, you would see the, the sky is covered with little speckles, uh, small speckles and big speckles. And uh, when we discovered that with our project, uh, Stephen Hawking said it was the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. And uh, I didn't know why it was so important to him right away, but now I appreciate that if the sky had not been like that, we would not understand how the universe could produce us. So uh, it was a pretty essential part of the discovery of our own history uh, that we were able to do with that uh, small observatory. Since then, uh, NASA has flown another satellite to measure it even better, and so has the European Space Agency. Uh, and so uh, many, many more discoveries have followed from that. So uh, about uh, six years after uh, we were done with that uh, project, and uh, sorry, after the launch of the project, I got a phone call from NASA headquarters that said it was time to start planning for the successor for the Hubble Space Telescope. So would I like to work on it? And of course I said yes, that's the most exciting thing I could possibly imagine doing. So uh, I said yes. And so we've been, uh, de first we started to design it and then we decided to actually make a contract to, to a big aerospace company to build the hard parts. And uh, now we are only three and a half years to launch. So uh, in October of 2018, we plan to launch the James Webb Space Telescope as a successor um, to the Hubble, uh, operated in very much the same way. So when John said that you could go uh, online and get the data from the Hubble Space Telescope, you will also be able to do the same with the James Webb Telescope. And so some of you will be uh, getting through school and perhaps uh, have a chance to actually observe with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, when the time comes, you would uh, write a proposal, you send it in to the committee, and they will say uh, yes or no. Uh, so then uh, if you're approved, then you get to get the data and uh, analyze it yourself. So uh, what do we hope to observe with this great new telescope? Uh, number one, we'll extend the discoveries of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, even beyond what the Hubble was able to uh, because the new one is bigger and is also able to observe infrared light, that's to say heat. So um, observing this new wavelength range uh, will show us new phenomena from the most distant part of the universe that we can observe. We hope to see the first stars and galaxies being born out of the primordial material. Uh, closer to home, we hope to see stars being born uh, inside those beautiful dust clouds that you can see yourself, uh, say, in the, uh, in the Sword of Orion or in those beautiful pictures that we get with Hubble Space Telescope. Even closer than that, we hope to see uh, planets around other stars. Uh, we already know that we should be able to do that and that uh, there's a, even the possibility to determine whether a little planet out there uh, that might be discovered between uh, now and the next few years would have enough water vapor to have an ocean. So maybe there's a little planet out there like home, and we would sure love to know that. So we don't know if it's out there. That's one of the discoveries we hope to be making. So uh, October 2018, that's the plan, uh, and uh, we push the button, and uh, actually the observatory will be carried up into space on a European rocket called the Ariane 5, and, uh, and we'll uh, start observing as soon as possible after that. So thanks uh, for uh, coming to hear about the stories, and we'll take more questions later. Awesome, awesome stuff. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> So now let's hear from NASA's uh, uh, chief scientist, Dr. Ellen Stoffer. I think this is on, right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, as Kevin said, I'm the chief scientist of NASA, and that means that I provide advice um, across all of the science that we do at NASA to the NASA administrator, an amazing guy named Charlie Bolden, who also is an astronaut like John, and I work really closely with John Grunsfeld. Um, really looking at all the science that we do about NASA, saying how can we take all of this information that we're gathering from the astrophysics information that John and John were talking about, to our studies of the planets here in our own solar system, to our studies of planet Earth. And we have actually over 19 satellites that NASA has with our international partners studying our own home planet, trying to understand how it's changing. Most of you know that climate change is a huge issue. Our planet is getting warmer sea level is rising and it's something we're really concerned about. So we're using all of our Earth observing satellites to try to better understand our own home planet. Now I'm a geologist, so when I was um, 
sort of maybe, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, I used to love to look outside and say, you know, how did the mountains around me form? How did these valleys form? Why does our planet look the way it does? And so I got really interested in geology, the study of how, how the surface of the Earth is formed. But my dad worked for NASA, and all of a sudden I realized, hey, I could do geology not just on Earth, but on all the planets of our solar system. So I actually study volcanoes on Mars, on Venus, and on one of the moons of Saturn. And you might say, why do you need to study volcanoes on all those different planets? Why not just study them here on Earth? Well, it turns out volcanoes are a little different on every planet. Every planet has different conditions, slightly different temperature, different pressure. That makes a volcano work slightly differently. So you can take a physical process, like how a volcano works, and you can learn more about it by studying that process on all the different bodies of the solar system. So I've been able to work on missions to Venus. Venus is an amazing planet, 900 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface, really hot, dreadful, you wouldn't want to go there. We call it Earth's evil twin, uh, because it's sort of like the Earth, except, except not at all. Um, it's made of the same stuff, it's about the same size, but it went down a totally different evolutionary path. So Venus is particularly interesting to me because it's sort of when we start thinking, as John Grunsfeld was talking about, looking for planets around other stars, looking for those other Earths, it's really important to understand in our own solar system how hard it is to get a habitable planet. We know the Earth is habitable. There's liquid water on the surface. We know that in the past, Mars used to be habitable because we know, especially from the Curiosity rover, that water existed for long periods of time on the surface of Mars. So we're using all our robotic explorers at Mars to try to get at that question of did life ever evolve on Mars? Ultimately, John Grunsfeld and I think it's going to take sending scientists to the surface of Mars to really answer that question, to really figure out was there ever life on Mars? Could there still be life on Mars maybe deep underground? Next, we want to send a mission out to Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter that has a liquid ocean, a water ocean, under an icy crust another place that maybe there could be life in our own solar system. So at NASA, we're using all of our spacecraft to look deep into the universe, to look uh, in our own solar system for this question of are we alone. And we're getting ready to send humans to Mars to help answer that same question using the International Space Station and all the research that we do up there. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions uh, in a minute. Awesome. Thanks very much. Let's give a hand. And to, to round up before we take questions, Dr. Claudia Alexandra. Okay, well, um, I was not inspired by, the, by looking out, nor by looking up for some reason. Um, I was inspired by uh, the words of John F. Kennedy, and I hear I'm going to do my JFK imitation. We do these things not because they are hard, but because they're easy, but because they are hard. Okay, so I thought I really would love to be somebody who does things that are hard. Um, and also, there was a TV show on called Cosmos, and they talked about a guy named Kepler who struggled all of his life to make circular orbits work and finally had to grasp this important truth that orbits were not circular. And I just always was impressed by doing things on paper and pencil and trying to make things work with models and having... Um, data that proves, that you have to prove, um, that shows the true physics of what's going on. So I've always been really, I love to do theory, I love to do models on the computer, and not that I don't love our surroundings, and I'm very inspired by being here in beautiful South Africa, but um, I like to try things that are hard, I like to work out things on computers, and I, use, I like using my head. Um, and so I work for Rosetta. I represent the United States of America on a European mission. And one of the most important things I do is make sure that our partnership is effective. Because it turns out that to go forward in space, we really need to partner with other countries. Because this stuff is hard to do, or hard to do. Uh, and so it really is effective. We have to learn how to be good partners with other countries, work together with other scientists, and go out and do things that are incredibly challenging. And I'll give you an example from Rosetta, which is an incredibly challenging mission that the European Space Agency took on to catch up with a moving comet and to be able to match the speed, to be able to go in orbit, 
it turns out that a comet has almost no gravity and the positions of the other planets are just as important in terms of determining where you are and the position where you are is complicated by this uh, uh, atmosphere that comes to life as you get close and so the Europeans decided to go to a comet, put a lander down without knowing anything about its target. They did not know the gravity. They did not know the mass. They did not know how much of this atmosphere was going to come out in order to, to that would make it difficult to navigate around the target. They did not have any high resolution pictures of what the landing site or the whole surface would look like. And yet they still took on the risk of putting the lander down and they were successful. So it is um, incredible to be able to work with people who are willing to take on risks like that. It's also great to be lucky um, and actually have success in that kind of environment. But here you are being challenged and using your head to try to do something that no one's ever done before. And that's part of what space exploration is all about. It's taking on things uh, that most people would think are impossible or don't do it. Wait until later when we have when we know more. But really going out and being bold and uh, and taking on some very highly technical challenges. Inspiring stuff. Thanks very much. Okay. Now the floor is open. Come on guys, this is your chance. If you thought that NASA was far away, well today is your chance to have a question directly to NASA. So let's I'll start the floor off with Steve. Hi there. Um, so the question is quite simple, that if you take the last 20 or 30 years and you plot where NASA has been moving and, and the projects that you've been developing and, and getting involved with, then you take the last five years and you look at the commercial space industry, things are changing faster than you can believe. SpaceX with our ex uh, our could we call him an ex South African our ex South African Elon Musk is obviously doing some amazing stuff and and then of course Virgin Galactic and everyone else is jumping on board so commercial space travel is going to become a reality very soon but not just that companies are going to want to put up satellites and do sorts of things that that NASA would have been doing and maybe even people want to do their own experiments and go and explore planets like Mars one. So how is that going to impact on NASA and your future programs? We know at NASA we're really excited about the commercial sector. In fact, we um, have gone over the last few years to having commercial cargo where SpaceX and Orbital Corporation launch cargo to the International Space Station. Starting two years from now, SpaceX and Boeing will launch um, uh, crew members, so astronauts from U.S. soil, which we right now we rely on the Russians to take our, our U.S. astronauts up to the International Space Station. So from two years from now, we'll have commercial companies to do that. NASA strongly feels that what we can turn over safely and reliably to the commercial sector, it's to our benefit, because then we can put our resources towards things that the commercial sector isn't interested in, potentially, like some of the technologies that we need to go into Mars. Um, so I think we're really excited about the fact that the commercial sector is getting more and more interested. Let's figure out how we can work together and partner. Because sending humans to Mars is hard. NASA can't do it by ourselves. We need to work with our international partners, all the space agencies of the world. We're going to need to work with the commercial sector. So, John, I'm sure you also have a, have a problem. Sure. sure. Our NASA, NASA has involved you know, corporations, companies, building things from the very beginning. And so it's very exciting now that there are new companies that are designing their own rockets uh, to be able to launch both our payloads, but also payloads for communication satellites. That's also not necessarily new. Uh, what's new is that Elon Musk uh, has created a company uh, to be able to do this in a very innovative way at a very high pace. And as Ellen said, we're now using that for uh, cargo to the space station, the way that people use, you know, the post office to send letters. You know, you just pay for sending it up. We're not quite there yet. But when it comes to doing science experiments, it's a little bit different because by building a rocket company, there's a hope that you can make money selling rockets. Uh, and currently we don't have an idea of how to make money selling knowledge. 
about Mars or about the planets. Um, but nevertheless, when we ask scientists, engineers, and companies to build a mission to go to Mars or to go to Europa, those companies have to invent new technology to be able to go and explore. And always that new technology ends up being something that allows us to have a new market for something here on Earth or improve life on Earth. A good example is that the reason that you're able to see me today on a camera that has a high resolution detector, a high resolution camera, is because we push technology to do astronomy, to make new and better cameras and smaller, lighter weight cameras. The first camera on the Hubble Space Telescope was the size of a refrigerator, uh, and now we're able to have it, you know, in the size of an eyeball and talk all the way from Washington, D.C. to South Africa. Great stuff. Um, okay, so I'm going to be looking to the audience to uh, for you to put your hands up. So I've got one hand already here. Let's have the question. A uh, quick introduction who you are and then name and where you're from and then ask your question. Thank you, Kevin. I am Bonaventure Okere from Nigeria. Uh, I thank the panelists. And uh, you have spoken well and I feel so much like you educated. But we're having a problem in this part of the world. I've heard what you said can be, could be the benefits of space uh, research or travels. But to a lay person, to a high school student, what message do you have for them that could encourage them to study space science or astronomy? Because they feel if I study astronomy, I will end up teaching the schools or the high school or the university. What else can, be of, can it be of benefit to either the government of our countries and to our young scientists? Okay, thank you very much. You, you guys can share that. Okay, yeah. I, you know, I would say there's a couple things, and then I'll, I'll, I'll answer quickly, and I'll let other people chime in, because I'm, I'm going to take two, two different aspects of that, because I think it's so important, and that's one of the reasons that I'm really excited to be here, is to be able to talk to students here about the importance of science, technology, edu uh, engineering, and math, because every country of the world needs to have those skills in order to solve the tough problems that we have ahead of us. For example, with climate change. Um, just this, in the past about six months, NASA just released a brand new high-resolution topographic data set over Africa. Um, we are right now, actually this week in South Africa, running a, a workshop to help um, scientists, decision makers here uh, in South Africa be able to use that data to better understand where are good places along the coastline to build new buildings if sea level rises. Where are the places most likely to have landslides? So we are collecting data from space that we can help train scientists around the world, scientists here in South Africa, to use. There's amazing astronomical observations going on in South Africa. You know, and I, we're in the, you're in the process here of building the square kilometer array, it's going to be an amazing telescope. A lot of great astronomy going on, and not just teaching astronomy, but making, having the opportunity to make new observations. The great discoveries, the next Einstein, the next John Mather isn't necessarily going to come from the United States or Europe. I predict the next great scientist is going to come from one of you guys. It's going to be you who are going to help solve climate change. It's going to be one of you who is going to help us figure out how to land humans safely on Mars. Science is a worldwide endeavor, and we're trying to solve hard problems, and we need everybody to participate. I, I think that a national space agency starts the process by just diving into science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that those things by themselves end up driving other industries. It's amazing how many spin-off industries are started by the need to solve some technical problem that you, that you do by trying to go into space. So you have to have communications. You need to have know how to get packets down to the ground and how to unpack the packets, how to encrypt your message. It's amazing how many new things you're driven to do when you're trying to do something esoteric like go into space. It's almost like something artistic. But that ends up making you solve other kinds of technical problems that spawn many other industries. So an individual person may find themselves not uh, sort of alone. But as a country, I think countries, just as NASA provided that service for the United States, countries end up benefiting when collectively 
people are doing science, technology, and math together. Excellent. Thanks very much. I want your hands up. Uh, so I, I, I saw a hand here. Thank you. My, my name is Peter Griss, and I'm the announcer on my newspaper. Um, I, I must admire NASA for what they've done, and particularly that wonderful thing they did with Curiosity, that sky crane. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And we talk about NASA, we talk about ESA, European State Authority, the British UK thing, and Spain and Spanish and the, and the Italians. Uh, what we ignore all the time is what the Chinese are up to. Now, the Chinese have the Long March rockets, and they're going very successful. I believe they've got something crawling around the moon at the moment. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that, uh, you know, they might take a march on us, and they might just put the first man on Mars. Now, I know that sounds highly speculative, but, I mean, I think we should consider this. And why aren't we working with the Chinese, or has any approach been made to work with them? Because they're certainly going great guns at the moment. Maybe, maybe if I can ask John, John Gransfeld to respond to that one, then... One of the great things about science is that it transcends all national borders. And so uh, Ellen mentioned the square kilometer array. You know, that's an international collaboration that really includes people from countries all around the world. On the International Space Station, we have a, a very large experiment called the uh, anti -matter magnetic spectrometer, alpha spectrometer. That's another grand experiment that includes people, scientists from all around the world, including Chinese scientists. So we do collaborate with the Chinese in many different areas, in commerce, in science, in technology. In human spaceflight, right now the U.S. and the Chinese are not cooperating, uh, collaborating, but the Chinese do collaborate with other countries. And this is part of politics. I do believe that when whichever country, and I believe it will be the U.S., leads the effort to put humans on Mars, that it will not be, you know, one country doing the mission to Mars. It will be everyone on planet Earth going through uh, collaborating uh, to put the first humans on Mars, not only to visit, but eventually to stay. It will be people of planet Earth uh, going to Mars. So the collaboration in human spaceflight with China is something that we talk a great deal about, uh, and and we'll have to see where that goes. The Chinese uh, space program have made great strides in their rocketry, in their astronauts, their taikonauts, and in lunar exploration uh, with the rover that they've uh, successfully landed on Mars. And it's a science rover. So uh, we think that's great. Excellent. Thanks very much. So let me see uh, the show of hands of all the questions that we have still waiting. Okay, I've got an idea, and we selected the next one. Um, I wanted to ask, um, uh, is it uh, was quickly your name and where, where are you from? Um, I'm Robin Sebi from um, Victoria Girls High. Um, I wanted to ask, as it was stated that um, there. Are there are volcanoes in other planets. Now, if the volcano would erupt, um, if lava like comes out, would it um, react with the other um, poisonous gases which make up the planet? And then if it would react, would it spread out to Earth or would it only stay in that specific planet? That's a great question. You know, when we, when we look at volcanoes, there are two things we really think about. One is the lava, the liquid rock, magma or rock that basically comes out onto the surface. And the other thing is the thing you talked about, the gases. So when a volcano erupts, you have rock coming out, and then you have a whole lot of gas being ejected, and usually little bits of rock being ejected out into the atmosphere. Amazing energetic process when you get a really strong volcanic eruption. Now, the, the amazing thing is that a planet's gravity holds all of that material close to the planet. So when a volcanic eruption happened in the past on Mars, or maybe if there's one happening right now on Venus, we're not sure about that, the eruption plume or that cloud coming out of the volcano doesn't make it much higher than, say, 5, 10 kilometers. So it doesn't go very high in the atmosphere. So all that nasty gas that comes out of the volcano actually stays on the planet. Now that's really interesting because then that affects the composition of the atmosphere. It affects the temperature of the planet. And so that's why one of the reasons we study volcanoes is because they're intricately linked with how an atmosphere of a planet changes over time. So volcanoes are really amazing that way. Even 
on small bodies like Jupiter's moon Io, which kind of looks like a pizza. Some of you have probably seen pictures of it. It's all orange and, and sulfury. Um, it has volcanoes erupting all the time. Io doesn't have much of an atmosphere, so that volcanic eruption that happens, some of it, some of the rocks and some of the gas goes into space, but most of it is still held by, by Io's gravity and it comes back down to the surface. But it's a great question. Great question. Let's see those hands again. There was uh, there was one behind. Listen, that side of the room is being very quiet there. I want to see those hands. <laughs> Hi, my name is George. I'm a science teacher. Um, I just wanted to ask the difference between the James Webb Telescope and, and the Square Kilometer Array that's, uh, that's happening in South Africa. That's the one question. And two, um, we are sort of uh, using up our fossil fuels, and eventually I think we might have to use solar energy. And I wanted to know what NASA was doing to, to extract energy from the sun, or what plans they had. Okay, maybe John may think can start with it. Yeah, so I wasn't quite sure of the, uh, of the exact connection there, but uh, certainly the Square Kilometer Array and the James Webb Space Telescope will both be making uh, tremendous advances in, uh, in what we can see. And uh, we both projects are certainly expecting wonderful surprises. Uh, the Square Kilometer Array, by the way, is supposed to be so powerful that if there were people on a planet way out there and they had a radar uh, at their airport, we would be able to pick that up uh, out to a distance of 50 light years away. So no one is expecting this, but you know it could be. So um, that would be the biggest surprise, I think. Uh, that would be a sign of intelligent life. So. Um, most likely what we'll see is uh, new ways of seeing the universe and the uh, amazing different pictures uh, we'll be able to see uh, inside uh, hot objects that uh, radiate radio waves very strongly. Uh, with a web telescope, uh, we'll be able to look at things very far back in time as well as looking at things close up that are, are like the Earth and like the solar system. So uh, I think uh, in both cases we're expecting uh, big surprises and I can't tell you what they're going to be. Now, when we think about converting the sun's light into electricity through solar panels, uh, much of that was pioneered by the need to provide power to satellites in space. When you're in space, you don't have a long cord that you can plug into the wall, and batteries wouldn't last very long. So many of the technologies for lightweight solar panels, and also very high efficiency solar panels, were pioneered in space. In fact, on the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we're flying some of the most efficient solar rays ever flown or ever built, uh, much more efficient than the typical solar rays on, that you might see on your house. And you're certainly right that the Earth has bathed plenty of energy from the sun, and so there's no reason that we shouldn't be taking advantage of that uh, to, to provide electricity, especially in remote towns and villages where they don't have access to a big power plant. Uh, you know, you're, you're blessed in... in South Africa and Africa with plenty of sunshine. So it's a very good way to produce uh, electricity. And the needs of the space age to have higher power in space is one of the things that's helping us here on Earth to get plenty of uh, solar energy. Great stuff. Let's see those hands again. Okay, there's been a very enthusiastic one in the back for a while. So let's hear from you. Hello. Um, my name is Astrid Hewlin. I'm from Zimbabwe and a veterinary ecologist. I have a question that I've noticed in the discussions that there's a technical challenge where we're looking for a planet that can support life, specifically water. Um, what is NASA doing, uh, and also in relation to the Nigerian colleague down there, um, with spreading knowledge about how the rivers are being restored in parts of Africa and all over the world? to flow all year round. Okay, thanks very much for the question. Who would like to take that? Um, I think John left. Um, John Brunsfeld, because I was going to let him answer that. You know, water is one of our most precious resources. Obviously, we can't live without it. That's, that's why we look for, as you said, for habitable planets. Water is really intricately tied into that. So, just this past year, NASA has actually launched a whole series of spacecraft that are all focused on studying the water cycle. One of them is called the Global Precipitation Mission. It measures precipitation all around the globe every three hours. And you might say, I know if it's raining outside or not, why do you need to do that from space? Well, think of it, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered 
by the oceans, and we don't know if it's raining out there or not. And you can think of rain as being kind of like energy. So you want to say, if I want to understand the water cycle, the weather cycle, the climate cycle, I need to know where it's storming, where it's not, if it's actually raining. So that one satellite is really important for that part of the water cycle. We just launched a satellite called the um, Soil Moisture Active Passive that looks all around the globe at soil moisture. Important for, again, understanding where does the water go? How much is being absorbed in the land? How, how to help a farmer decide where the best place to plant a crop is? And then also to use that information for food security. Where is an area that they might start having famine because we know the soil is so dry the crops are going to fail? So we try to attack at NASA all the different parts of the water cycle to understand what's happening. Huge concern right now with climate change. Um, for example, in California, where Claudia is from, um, they've been experiencing a drought that many scientists link to climate change, similar problem in India. We use another satellite that we have called GRACE that measures the gravity, so you can actually see that in areas of California and in India, we've been taking so much water out of the aquifers that the land surface is actually dropping, dropping, dropping. Now that's really a concern, because once you start pulling water out of permanent aquifers, will the aquifer ever fill back up again or not? So the health of rivers, the health of, of lakes, the health of our aquifers where we get our, all get our fresh water from all around the globe is something that we use all of these 19 satellites that we have um, at NASA to try to address this problem. Because one of the biggest impacts to humankind from climate change is going to be changing patterns and availability of water because it's so crucial for life. So a huge area of concern one we're really focused on. Very good question. Let's see those hands again. I'm not seeing many of the of the students here. So I want to I want to I want to hear more more from the students. You've you've had a very enthusiastic hand up. <laughs> Is it on? Oh. <laughs> Right. I I'd like to applaud NASA for the role they've played to this day on getting the public engaged. And I think they present a shining example of what's possible. As an emerging uh, my name is Dan from Sansa by the way. As an emerging space nation ourselves, we find ourselves challenged by competing needs. People asking the question, why invest in space when there is so much need for this, that, and the other? NASA could help us share those examples of how they've managed to pull general public onto the side pro-development through outer space exploration. But most importantly, Building on to the, 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 the comment that was made earlier regarding how we are solving societal problems on Earth using space as a platform. These missions that are being developed, for example, measuring soil moisture and th this and the other, the data policy regarding the data sets generated from them, how openly accessible will they be, particularly to scientists in the developing world? Because for me, the true value of the data lies in its use rather than just generating it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I completely yeah. agree with you. And data availability is something we, we are really concerned about at NASA. And so um, all of our data from our Earth science missions, um, we usually take a, a period of time, usually on the order of three months, to validate the data to make sure that they are accurate. And then they are all available uh, um, via the, the internet to anybody who wants to use them. Now. We're even trying to go a step further because you can say, all right, you put all these complex data sets out there, but how am I going to know how to use them? And so that's why we have a group called SERVIR. That's a joint project between the U.S. Agency for International Development and NASA. And with SERVIR, we actually are, as I said, we're running a workshop this week to help us use some help uh, users um, in Africa learn how to use the shuttle radar to power emission data. Um, but we also work with, with users around the world to use our, all of our various data sets. We are working on this a lot in the United States because it's a huge issue all over the world on 
how we make our NASA data available, not just to but say you're a town planner in a town along a coast in the United States or in Nigeria, and you think, well, I have to build a hospital. Where am I going to put that hospital? I can't put it in an area that might flood with climate change and sea level rising and storm surges. But also make it available for people who maybe aren't interested in the science of the data. And I always um, you know, okay. now, one of the things I think it's critical, you know, we estimate at NASA that for every dollar that's invested in NASA, about four dollars goes into the US economy. So when why it's important to invest in space programs, it's because those are good jobs in that country we don't launch money into space. Um, we launch stuff that's built in good jobs. Um, in engineering, in science, um, in math, using those kind of skills. And we do it again using instruments that come from all over the world, using spacecraft that are built all over the world. And so to me, when a government invests in a space program, they're investing in the future of their country because they're investing in those high technology, really good industries that have all kinds of spin-offs that help everybody in the long run. Something else, which is that um, it's really up to you, uh, in some respects, addressing the rivers and addressing some of the issues we have is political. And you have to convince the political leaders that these things are necessary and there may be pushback. If you have our science teacher and you want, you're teaching people and they want to know what will I do with this, eventually those students become the experts. And it's really those students who are telling us what needs to be done, what the next steps are. And the days when people can sit in their office and doodle away and do whatever pleases them are kind of done. People need to work together in teams because that's how science is done these days. And teams of people need to instruct us on what's the next cool thing or what's the next cool idea. So it's really our responsibility to make sure you guys have the education but then you guys really have to use your imagination to begin to invent the future. That's your job. Awesome. I think uh, uh, I want I want some more questions from the from, from the students. There were there were there were two here. Let me. What's your name? Where are you from? Any question? Um, my name is Asa, and I'm from Victoria Girls High. And I just want to know. Um, since NASA sent in so many satellites and things into space and they have discovered so many things already and they know that there's hardly any life on the planets in, our, um, in space, I want to know what, um, like they're working on things at the moment, I want to know why do they want to find out those things if they already know um, like the things that they can already expect from what they've gathered. You know, I, I actually would take a little bit of a dis disagreement with you because we know there's certainly not life like us on the other planets on our solar system. There are not plants. There are not simple animals. But, you know, life evolved here on Earth. Earth formed, you know, about four and a half billion years ago. By about 3.9 billion years ago, there were very simple life forms here on Earth, but kind of at the microbial level, so microscopic forms of life. That's what we expect to find. That's what I expect to find as a scientist on places like Mars, maybe under the icy crust of Europa, maybe even on Saturn's moon Titan, places in the solar system where we think maybe we can find really simple forms of life, and then we'll look at those forms of life and say, do they have RNA and DNA like we do? Are they completely different? Are their cells the same as our cells? But that life is going to be really hard to find. So that's what we've been figuring out. Big complex life us, giraffes, no. Simple forms of life, probably, but boy is it going to be hard to find. And then, but we're going to learn so much about it because it's those very simple forms of life that really tell you how life works. So let me say one other thing, which is that somehow or other human beings have a certain hubris where we say, well, we know everything. And I'll give you two examples. One is at the end of the uh, 19th century where they said, well, we know everything. There's no more need for science. Because, except for this thing about the atom, there, there's some things about the atom that we don't know. But basically, we know everything there is needed. And then a whole century of knowledge and completely things that completely changed our ideas. Uh, from medicines to 
uh, uh, physical science to astronomy. Uh, so to be able to say, well, I guess we know it all now. And then the same thing happened at the end of the 20th century. Somebody wrote a book that said, the end of science, because we know everything. So I guess we don't need to fund any science agencies. So I, I really think there's, um, it's tempting. We humans have a temptation to believe how smart we are. <laughs> Uh, but we, it, what ends up happening when you get data in your hands is you realize that uh, you you still have a long way to go towards understanding a whole host of things. Thanks. I, I, I could see John was reacting to that. Do you want to say something on this, John, before we move to the next question? Um, I didn't have anything really to add except that uh, everything we know about planets around other stars has been a surprise. Uh, not a single thing that we know about them was expected. So. Uh, we didn't know how they were formed. We didn't know how big they would be. We don't know how they got where they are. And so uh, that's the one example of how right she is, that uh, everything we know in a whole area was completely unexpected. So I think that's true of everything about science here on Earth, too. There's so many surprises yet in front of us. So thanks, John. I think we, we, we're going to need to start rounding up. So get to, last chance to get your question in. So let's see some high hands here. Um, Okay, there was there was there was uh, let me let me come around. <laughs> that section of the audience hasn't been touched yet, so let's let's send that to this. Right, your name, where you from, and and your quick question. Well, um, I'm Lika, and I'm from Kanye's High School, and I'm Tata. Well, I, l I watch a lot of cartoons. So when you watch cartoons, you kind of like see the planets rotating. I want to know, like, when the astronauts go out on space, do they see the planets rotating physically? That's a great question. John, you want to you wanna, you wanna say what you saw from space? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, if, if an astronaut can go out and look back at the planet, yes, they'll see that other planets rotating too. Uh, they do not rotate at the same rate exactly. Uh, Mars rotates uh, just a little slower. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn rotate a lot faster. Uh, and they're all different. Uh, but yes, they all do spin. Yes. Okay, thanks. Let's, let's, let's have, th there's a very enthusiastic person who's been trying for a long time to get a question in. And anyone else who wants to get one last question in? Let's see your enthusiasm. Okay, there's, there's, there's one I see there. You will be the last question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rejoice. I'm coming from the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences and Mathematician. Uh, to the panelists, I want to know what is NASA doing in terms of recruiting and retaining women? And to Dr. Alexandra and Stephen, what are the challenges that you encounter throughout your journey? And please share with us the lesson learned. Did you have any mentors, people who would help you through this journey? And if so, how did it affect your career as a woman in space science? Well, first of all, I, I was going to say before I got that in question that we have incredible girl power, not to denigrate the men in the audience, but we've got incredible girl power in this audience. We've had lots of girls asking questions, and I absolutely love that. Thank you, because, you know, if we only have 50% of our population, guys, trying to solve our big scientific problems that we have. We're never going to solve them. We need everybody in the population to feel empowered to say, I can be a scientist too. I can be an engineer. I can do computer science. So it's really important when we want to solve big problems to make sure we have our whole diverse population working on it. And that means men, women, people from South Africa, people from the United States. Um, I, I Certainly as a woman, and, and I'll let Claudia answer in a second, you know, I've always been one of the minority at, at my work. You know, most of the people, when I go in a meeting, most of the people in the meeting are, are men. Um, and sometimes that's hard. Sometimes you think, do I really belong here? And then it makes me start to doubt myself because I think, well, if there's no one here that looks like me, do I really belong here? And then I have to say to myself, I have something to say. I, I can contribute. And, and it makes you have to have a little more self-confidence because sometimes you don't always feel welcome. But, but I think that's why having mentors is so important. And I've had male scientists who were mentors, um, people like Charles Alachi, who's now the head of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, who really helped me, Dr. Diane Evans, another woman at NASA, who really helped me. 
And I've had women I've really looked up to at NASA. For example, Sally Ride, our first woman astronaut, who I think, wow, this woman is a real hero. There's a woman that, that is my new hero at NASA. She's a woman who worked at NASA in, in the early 1960s. Her name was Katherine Johnson. She was an African-American woman at a time where women just didn't go to school and get degrees. She had a PhD in math. She worked at NASA, and she helped calculate all the trajectories that helped send the first humans up into space and bring them safely home. Huge hero of mine. So when I think sometimes, oh, I'm having a hard day or there's no one here, I think about Katherine Johnson, and it makes me sit up a little straighter. Um, I think as a woman, when you're in a, a mostly male environment, one of the toughest things is to be taken seriously or to feel like you're being taken seriously, especially when you're a young woman. The older I get, you know, people see this gray hair and, you know, and, and also I'm a little bit more mature myself, so I don't worry about that anymore. I say what I want to say, and I don't worry about what people think. Um, but that's what happens when you are a little bit more mature. I certainly, when I was starting my career, was much more worried about being taken seriously and also felt that I wasn't being taken seriously. Um, I think every successful person, every successful person, as mentors in, this, in their career. And sometimes you can't in advance choose your mentor. Mentors and mentees choose each other. So somebody can't assign you to a mentor, for example. Um, I have had three fantastic male mentors who just popped in when I really needed help. One of them popped in when I was chewing somebody out on the telephone. He was walking by and he backed up and he stuck his head in my office, and when I was done with the phone, he said, what was that? And I explained the problem, and I was very upset, and he was like, okay, okay, so you're right, but you need to find a different way of expressing your unhappiness. Um, and so, uh, and I had another person pluck me out of a job and say, I want you in my division, and actually help me. Uh, uh, in a very critical time in my career. So every successful person has that, though. So you should expect um, that, that you're going to have help and not be embarrassed or hide or shamed if people come forward to offer to help you, uh, because that's how it works in a career. Um, I think that's about all I have to say. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, we're going to have to round it up. So we've got one last question. And uh, your name, where are you from? My name is Pelele Uda from Kings High School. Air. Global warming is affecting Earth. Can anything that you can do to to help the global warming affecting our Earth? And, and if global warming is very high, can can still life exist in Earth? Oh yes, life will exist on Earth. Um, but let me turn that question around. Um, it's up to all of us to try to find the solutions. And I especially think that it's up to you because I'm going to be old when the climate change problems really come to fruition. It's really, I hate to say this, but it is your problem. And I hate to do this to you. Okay, I feel like I'm, I'm doing the best I can personally to try to do everything to reduce my carbon footprint, as they call it. But um, ultimately, the problems we're going to have are going to take everybody's brain, everybody all hands on deck. And that means you and you and you. You smart people, you're so clever with your smartphones. And you're so clever with your apps for everything. Well, we need an app for climate change, okay? We don't have all the answers right now. What we need are mitigation steps. We need to figure out how to maybe design different kinds of building materials, how to design maybe different kinds of asphalt that allows the ground to breathe. It's possible that maybe the ground can suck back the carbon dioxide. So we may need to expose more of the ground in big cities that are paved over. We may need to find new and innovative methods of handling the problem, and we need to be willing to accept the inconvenience. Maybe it's more expensive. Maybe we have to have electric cars, and maybe that's expensive for me personally, that it's not cost effective to have an electric car right now, but maybe that's what I need to do to help the problem. So what I'm saying is 
everybody put your thinking cap on, learn all the science you can from your teacher, because we're going to need all of our ingenuity, and we have plenty of that to solve the problem. It is a serious problem, and, and I apologize on behalf of the human race for giving it to your generation. It is going to affect our generation right now. For example, when there are big storms in Florida, we actually have to start pumping out streets um, that are just pumping and flooding and flooding. And so we're going to have to make hard decisions in the future. Where are we going to put coastlines in safer places? So many of our cities are located right on coastlines. How are we going to cope with that? There's tough decisions ahead. But as Claudia said, what we need is for everybody in the world to be helping be part of the solution, whether it's through helping to invent new ways of distributing power, new ways of developing power. Excellent. Thanks very much for that last question. And thank you very much for your questions. So sorry that we can't get through more questions, but we need to round up now. So I'm going to ask the panel just to give their rounding up thoughts. Uh, first Ellen, then John, then Claudia. But before they start that, uh, um, uh, we had a message from, from John Gransfeld, who, who unfortunately had to leave. Uh, uh, it shows how important he is at NASA. You know, he has to attend to big NASA business. Um, but uh, um, be before they give their closing thoughts, let me just say thank you to all of you for your questions. Thank you to the panelists for, 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 for being here. Uh, and thank you especially to Jim Adams, who's standing at the back there, who's uh, um, another. <laughs> he's, he's, he's the man behind uh, uh, um, putting together this session. And he's uh, uh, also, also from NASA. Uh, so uh, thank you to everyone, to SciFest and to, and to NASA. Uh, and I think uh, uh, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to le let them uh, close off with their closing thoughts before we all head off. You know, my main closing thought is you guys ask great questions, and I wish we had even more time to answer your questions. And, and my hope is that, that so many of you maybe think about a career in science or technology, engineering or math, that some of you say, I want to be an astrophysicist. I want to be a geologist and study this planet and other planets. I want to be an engineer and help build instruments for future um, telescopes here in South Africa or, or future maybe instruments that might fly on a NASA or a European or a South African satellite. These are things you can do. Uh, and it just takes, sometimes math gets hard, sometimes physics gets hard, but it's saying, I can do this. And I know you guys can do it. And I know you're going to be our scientists, our engineers of the future that are going to help us work on these tough problems that we have. So thank you. Thanks, Sir. John? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to say uh, that this is uh, a wonderful conference and that the uh, challenge for our future is for each and every one of us to look around and say, there's a problem right next to me, and I think I could do something about it. Maybe it takes a little science, technology, engineering, or math to think about it, uh, but I'm going to start today and solve that kind of problem. So I'm going to recruit my friends, uh, build a little team, uh, think about it, uh, work out the science and everything, and, and really try to improve things for myself and my neighbors. And uh, that's how it's going to work to uh, solve the problems that we all share. So thanks for taking it on. You don't know that you're taking it on, but you're going to do it. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Claudia? Yeah, so I really want to say that you are important. You are the generation that's to come. You guys have uh, a lot of work to do. But not only are you important in terms of what you're learning and what you're going to go forward to do, but in terms of your ingenuity and your desire and your willingness to tackle it. I know because all throughout human history, we have had the ingenuity to solve our problems. And so I want to tell you right now, each and every one of you has that ingenuity. And each and every one of you is important. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>